Good evening, everybody. My name's Paul Johnson, and I'm the chair of the South Wales and West of England uh, APM committee. Um, welcome to this evening's webinar. I'm really pleased to be able to uh, introduce Sophie Orkel, uh, who's an experienced management consultant who specialises in programme leadership, business change, and also digital transformation uh, to talk to us tonight. Um, just a quick bit of housekeeping before uh, we get on with the main presentation. Um, we will be sending evaluation kind of emails out to people, so please do respond. Let us know your thoughts for what you want for uh, future events. Um, and as we're running this event, please do submit any questions you have into the chat function. Uh, and Rob Allen, who's uh, hosting us, will then put these to Sophie during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. From an APM perspective, um, our South Wales and West of England branch is planning a mix of face-to-face -face and also virtual uh, events going forward. I think this is to kind of cater for everybody's needs. I do think webinars have been a success, uh, but reintroduction of face-to-face -face events uh, will really bring that networking back. Um, quick reminder for me around the APM website uh, includes an awful lot of uh, excellent resources, uh, APM learning, um, all the PM modules and supporting resources to help you develop your knowledge and skills. Quick reminder around Chartered as well. Um, there's an awful lot of excellent guidance documents available for Chartered Project Professional. We've now got over 2,500 successful CHPP um, kind of uh, people. Um, and there's been several webinars to assist with how you prepare for the CHPP journey. Um, final note around the APM, um, it is its 50th birthday today. Uh, we're promoting the benefits of joining the APM as a, an associate member in the 50th anniversary. So it's 50% off if anybody who wants to join as an associate member, please do use the code APM50. Uh, this is available until March next year. Looking at branch events specifically, um, we have got a face-to-face -face event on the 8th of September, which is called the Who and How of High Performance Teamwork, which will be delivered by Nick Fewings. Uh, he's a fantastic presenter, awful lot of books as well, uh, very kind of um, active on LinkedIn. So that'd be a really good event. On the 13th of September, we're going to be holding our first uh, first day seminar for some time. And this is all about how you set projects off on the right track. This is being held in Barwa in North Bristol. And there's a fly with full event details on the APM website. Uh, and again, that'll be great value at £45 for members. That's all day, includes refreshments and lunch as well. Following that, we'll be doing a virtual networking event, uh, a discussion around stakeholder engagement in the hybrid world. So again, very topical and very appropriate. So that'll be a webinar like tonight's event. Uh, and then final thing really is the um, 11th of October, we'll be going to be doing our Southwest Project Management Conference, again in support of the APM's 50th birthday. We're going to be looking at what project management profession has achieved in its first 50 years and the challenges for the future. Uh, this is going to be held in the SS Great Britain uh, at Bristol, so that should be a fantastic event. That's all for me in terms of housekeeping, so it's now my great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Sophie Orkel, who's going to talk to us about and introduce the uh, introducing ethical hacking to the Ministry of Defence and the project management behind the innovation. Sophie, over to you. Thanks, Paul. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Really excited to be here today. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please, Rob. OK, so thanks. So I'm here to talk to you about how we introduced ethical hacking to Ministry of Defence. So I'm going to start off with some introductions, so a bit about me, and then I'll talk you through what is ethical hacking, give you some background. Following that, we'll go into why did, why did the Ministry of Defence need ethical hacking and what we were asked to do. Then the bulk of today's presentation will focus on the how. So how did we do this? And then I will round us off with um, the results. So what were the outcomes and benefits? And hopefully I'll leave you with some takeaways. OK, if you can go to the next slide, please. So a bit about me. My name's Sophie Okal, and as the slide says and Paul said, I've got over 10 years of program leadership, business change, and digital transformation experience. I started my career at Babcock in, in project management, where I worked on more traditional waterfall projects, looking at design and build of submarine parts. Since then, I've kind of moved into more technology-based projects and 
I went to Atkins to get some more breadth of that of that experience where I worked as a project management consultant. So I worked across government quite a lot on digital transformation and more recently on cyber. So it was with Atkins uh, that I delivered ethical hacking into the Ministry of Defence. And hopefully you're going to be able to tell as we go through the presentation, I really enjoyed this project and found it really interesting. So much so that I've just made the move under a fortnight ago to move to work at HackerOne, which was the supplier we worked with. So that should mean I can cover quite a lot of perspectives on this topic. Um, but just a disclaimer that I am speaking on behalf of myself and not on behalf of Atkins, the Ministry of Defence or HackerOne. OK. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So I'm going to tell you a bit about hacking. Um, there's a few, few th things that I'm going to cover on this, but we'll, we're going to start with what is a hacker? A lot of people, when they see the word hacker, automatically think of them as malicious or a threat. But if we're thinking like that, we're defining the rule by the exceptional case, that of criminality. Criminals are normally and always the minority. They're far outnumbered by responsible citizens and normal law-abiding people. So I want to put this alternative definition to you. A hacker is someone who enjoys the challenge of creatively overcoming um, obstacles. And more specifically, we think of people who are able to find vulnerabilities in software and hardware. OK, we're going to go to the next slide and we have got a bit of a mentee poll for you. So um, I think we've all, I'm sure, I hope you've all heard of the phrase bug in, refer like in reference to, to a problem with the computer. So where did the, that term bug first come from? Did it come from the idea, um, did it come from, hack start this again, <laughs> um, did someone do a hack that put a bug on the screen of computer when it, when it happened? Was it to do with a physical insect? Or is it a turn of phrase that's related to the annoyance of having to deal with an error? Excellent. Thank you, Sophie. Um, so we've already got 70% of the people in the audience voted away. So I'll give it a couple more, couple more seconds and uh, give those um, extra people some additional time. Um, there is, well, I'm not going to say anything. I don't want to sway the results. Okay. Um, but let's see. I'll give it 10 more seconds, everyone. Um, and that should feature in your control panel on your screen. Uh, three, two, one, close. So the results are in. 23% uh, a hack that, that put a bug on the screen. 38% uh, and 38% for the other two. So what was the number one again? Sorry. Uh, How so 38% uh, for a physical insect and 38% a turn of phrase related to etc. Okay, great. Cool. So that's joint, joint first place. Okay, so that actual answer is number two, a physical insect. The, so the story goes, so US Navy Rear Admiral Grace Hopper coined the terms bug and debug after the team at Harvard University found that their computer, the Mark II, was delivering consistent errors. So they opened up the computer hardware and had a look. And what did they find? They found a moth. So the trapped insect had disrupted the electronics of the computer. Um, so it was a real life bug. Um, it was a real life bug, which is what caused the problem. But now it's actually has ended up being a turn of phrase, which I think came from that. And that was like one of the first computers that, that was invented. So, yeah. So if we can go to the next slide, we're going to go into what is a vulnerability. So a vulnerability is generally a set of conditions that allows the violation of an explicit or implicit security policy of the user. Um, they can have a range of severities depending on what impact they have, and that is categorized using a system called the Common Vulnerability Scoring System, CVSS, which we'll mention later. 
So we know what vulnerabilities are, we know about bugs, we know about hackers. So what about hacks? So some of you will remember the WannaCry hack. I think this is probably the most famous one in the UK, which happened in May 2017. So it targeted computers running the Microsoft Windows operating system by encrypting data and demanding ransom payments in Bitcoin. It was propagated through Eternal Blue, which is an exploit or vulnerability, which was actually developed by the United States National Security Agency, but was stolen from them and then leaked by, by a group called the Shadow Brokers a month prior to the attack. Um, so Microsoft had actually released patches to, to fix this exploit, but much of WannaCry's spread was as a result of organizations that had not applied them or were using older systems that were past their end of life. Um, so I think we'll all remember what it did to the NHS. So we know what happens when it goes wrong, but what about when it goes right? So one of the top ethical hackers in the world is a guy called Franz Rosen, who is from Stockholm. Um, so he once found a really special vulnerability in Slack, that popular messaging um, site. Um, and that was, um, he found this by chaining together several low criticality vulnerabilities. And um, by putting them together, it could trick users into handing over access to their accounts which obviously has a, can have a huge impact. He was able to report it to Slack uh, through their bread bounty program. He was awarded 3,000 US dollars and Slack were able to fix it within six hours. And then uh, Franz has written a blog about, about the whole thing so you can follow that link through on the slide after if you're interested. But yeah, so what a difference. It can either take down organizations or we can report it to an organization, they can fix it and the hacker can earn some money. Okay, so if we can go on to the next slide, please. So we've started to talk about the threat in terms of bad actors, but what about how organizations are making themselves vulnerable to these bad actors? So the cyber threat and the attack surface is increasing, not just within the Ministry of Defense, but across all organizations. So this is uh, looking based on some research which was carried out by HackerOne across over a thousand customers. And um, just to give you an idea of like the common problems and the common causes of why we need ethical hacking. So um, development teams are creating new applications, versions, features faster than ever before. This is inadvertently also creating flaws faster than ever before. Operations are now setting up environments to run these new applications, often across different cloud vendors with different underlying technologies, causing misconfigurations faster than ever before. IT, while administering software and apps, is inheriting more vulnerabilities. And then the security teams, they're already outnumbered by developers. Keeping up, they have to keep up with new code, new architectures, and new technologies. Um, they often need help in filling their knowledge gaps and keeping their own skills up to date. And it's a really competitive market for these skills, so we find that they are often under-resourced. Um, so now we've understood the, uh, no. um, so this then results in us having, and organizations having incomplete knowledge of their attack surface. Um, the testing frequency is not keeping up with the rate that apps are being updated. So new, new uh, flaws are introduced and then we're not testing often enough to be able to pick them up before someone else might. Testing is shallow or basic, so it's often can be seen as a tick box exercise and um, teams often choose like a, the most basic test to, in order to meet the requirements of their organization rather than to try and actually check their security with more in-depth tests. And then the defensive skills um, of, this, of the monitoring teams are untested or unavailable. So that's a bit of background in terms of, you know, what the, the cyber threat is and what are the problem many organizations are facing. I'm sure it's true of, of the organizations you work in as well. So if we can go to the next slide, we'll start to talk about um, the Ministry of Defense. 
So I want to give you a bit of background on the organization itself. So it is a huge organization. It has over 60,000 full-time civilian employees and 159,000 in the armed forces. And it's made up of, of many different departments, which are their own organizations, each with their own cultures and, and often IT. And I'm sure that you kind of have an idea from what you know about the Army, the Navy and the RAF, that they, they're all, they've all got their own brands. And so if you think, then add in the secretive nature of some of the work that they do, it can be really difficult sometimes to, to find people or fully map the organization. So it was a really stiff, it was a really complicated stakeholder lines, landscape. But yeah, like many other organizations, the Ministry of Defense realized that it needed to improve its cyber defenses. With thousands of attempted cyber attacks daily, um, the Ministry of Defense capabilities, including tools, platforms, and devices, are vulnerable to a range of malicious threats. So they established the Cyber Resilience Program, which was tasked to reduce the cybersecurity risk, exploiting innovation where appropriate. And the Vulnerability Research Project, which is what we're going to talk about, was established within this program to uncover vulnerabilities, and it was tasked to Atkins to deliver. It was uh, strategically important and pioneering within the, the Ministry of Defense. It was initially tasked to deliver a vulnerability disclosure program and one bug bounty challenge. At the time when we started to be able to, when we started, it was seen as a huge achievement to be able to just deliver those, as convincing the organization to work with the hacking community and establishing the contracts that would facilitate them was no small ask. Um, so both of these capabilities have been used by the US Department of Defense for five years at this point, and vulnerability disclosure was being utilized by the National Cybersecurity Center in the UK. So I was given a couple of contacts and told to give it a go. So I did. Okay, just a couple more definitions um, before we go into, into the how. So there were three different capabilities that we introduced, which are all different ways of working with the ethical hackers. So first of all, there's the Vulnerability Disclosure Program, which is a reactive reporting process to allow an organization to receive reports from external researchers. This is not incentivized and acts as a see something, say something process if hackers are to find vulnerabilities. Then, then we had our Bug Bounty Challenge. This is a time-bound, invite-only engagement where hackers are asked to find vulnerabilities in a specific system and they are paid for what they find. Sorry, just to check, did we go to the next slide there? Uh, yes, we're all good. Um, and the, the payment for the, for the bug bounty in the bug bounty challenge on the vulnerabilities is based on that criticality of the vulnerability as per that CVSS scoring system we mentioned earlier. And then finally, we introduced the Vulnerability Rewards Program, which is invite only. And hackers are incentivized through rewards, but it is not time bound and often looks at a wider range of assets than a challenge. OK, if we can go to the next slide and we'll really get into the how and uh, talk a bit more about how we do the project management and business change. So as this was a really innovative project for the Ministry of Defence, I took a business change focused approach, applying Cotter's eight step process for leading change. What I've put together on the slide here is a timeline. So we've got the project events along the top um, to give you a bit of an idea of how we progressed. And then we've got, the, we've got Cotter's eight steps along the bottom so you can see how and when we applied them in relation to the activities. So I'm going to take you through each of the steps and what we did for them in the following slides. For now I'll give you a quick overview of how it all fitted together. So uh, obviously we started with project initiation. We followed the first four steps, we did them in, in quite a quick succession. Um, we created a sense of urgency, 
built a guiding coalition, formed a strategic vision initiatives, and communicated the change vision. You can think of this as preparing the organization for change. Um, so once we prepared it, we started actually doing the change. So we established the vulnerability disclosure program. This was the easiest to achieve as we were able to make use of a service that was offered by the National Cyber Security Center. So there was no cost involved, there was no contract, and um, that enabled us to have our first short-term short win. We then had to remove barriers to be able to establish a contract with a new supplier who had very different ways of working and terms and conditions. Try uh, um, putting the Ministry of Defense in the UK together with a uh, Californian-based tech company. There were some differences. So once we got that contract in place, we convinced our first asset that we were able uh, to, to participate in the first bug bounty challenge and we, we got it going and, and completed it. So we'd achieved what we initially had, had been tasked to do within the time that we'd been given with, to the budget that we'd been given and we'd actually done it. So both of these were um, really successful. And so by sharing the success, we were then able to build on that change and acquire additional funding and increase the team size and the scope. And then once we'd, we'd got the team on board, we'd increased the scopes, we then went back to steps one to four of Cotter's model to prepare for, for the next round of change. So we made sure that we still had the right people in our coalition, that our strategic vision uh, still fitted, that there was still that sense of urgency, and we communicated it. Then we delivered three more bug bounty challenges, which were bigger and better, and we also introduced the Vulnerability Rewards Program. By getting more and more teams involved, we were really starting to get to make that change stick. And, um, you know, this kind of brings us up to the current day where we are, the team are still working towards getting these capabilities fully integrated in, into business as usual. And I'm sure we'll probably have to revisit some of the steps again. Just and if we can go to the next slide, I'm just going to drink some water. OK, so create a sense of urgency. This, we're gonna, this is our first step. So I identified what were the existing threats and opportunities. So the biggest opportunity for us was that there was already an existing conversation on cyber. People were, or, people were already concerned about it. It was a hot topic, so we could really take advantage of that. But on the flip side, other people, some people had had enough of being talked to about cyber, had, you know, teams felt like, They'd already done enough and they didn't want to do any more. Um, and it was, you know, quite a lot for them to take on, as you, I'm sure people will find with any change. They had a bit of fatigue. So um, one of the things that we found ourselves saying so often, again and again, was if your house was burning down, wouldn't you want to know? Like, you're going to have vulnerabilities. And so isn't it better, like, isn't it better that you know about them? rather than just trying to pretend that you, there isn't a fire in the kitchen. Um, so we developed some, a value proposition and, and a clear pack with simple explanations um, of this. And if we can go to the next slide, please. So build a guiding coalition. So this um, ties nicely into step one because we use the coalition to build our sense of urgency. And this was a really big one for us. And I think a big thing that really helped make us successful was the fact that we really had our senior leadership brought into this. So we engaged with the program manager, the senior user, the SRO, our senior responsible owner, and we used them as advocates across the organization. So we utilized their presence on cross organization board meetings to advertise our project and to push messages out to get people to come and to get them to convince people to come and participate. Um, and so we initially started off with um, having weekly meetings with our one star, which for those of you who aren't familiar with the <laughs> Ministry of Defense and their um, hierarchy, that's kind of like a director level um, and our program manager. 
Um, we started off with one, with weekly meetings. We would to help us get the direction, the pace, and agree requirements. Um, but you know, we we downscaled that frequency as we got more and more established. But by developing those that that great relationship early on, it meant that when we had a problem and we needed something, to, we needed some help, we could easily go to them and and escalate, and and we had that easy route there. Um, we also were so lucky that we had all these experts that could help us. I mean, I say lucky, but we we also did seek them out, and, and as anyone else can. Um, so we learned from the experts at the U.S. Department of Defense um, in the National Cybersecurity Center and at the supplier Hacker One. Okay, and if we can go to the next slide, please. So we formed our strategic vision and initiatives. So our vision was to integrate external best security, external best practice, cybersecurity research and testing into defense. And then we had our mission, which was to reduce cyber risk across the Ministry of Defense through finding vulnerabilities in their systems. OK, and the next slide, please. So communicate the change vision. So this is where we really aim to capture the hearts and minds of the members of the organization. So we were willing to talk to anyone and everyone and we engaged, but we, we engaged with interested parties such as security and monitoring teams, previous participants, the accreditation team, and we really tried to like get them to be our champions. Um, and you can see on the right of the slide here. So this is one of the diagrams that we made. Um, this is um, this talk. This takes you through the different steps uh, within the bug bounty challenge. And um, so this, the fact that we had like a queer graphic that we could um, give to people and talk them through, I think that was um, help really helped with engagement. We made we made it really clear what the process was and what the steps were that they were going to have to go through. And then, and then finally on this slide, we really prioritize stakeholder engagement. It was so important. So taking that takes us on to the next slide, please, where we're going to talk a bit more about the stakeholder engagement. So it was a, I can't, you know, I'm saying this again, but it was a really complex stakeholder landscape. And we made, we, we knew that this was going to be a big challenge for us. And so we made a big effort to continually do stakeholder engagement. We started by mapping, but we were aware that we didn't, what we didn't know, what we didn't know. Um, and we tried our best to map out, but, and we were always willing to apologize if we'd missed talking to someone. And we were always willing to, and we were always asking whoever we talked to if there was anyone else we thought they thought we should know about, and asking you know who you know asking them for recommendations of other people. Um, so yeah, it was really significant in the, like good. The fact that we did this well was really significant to I think the project's success. Um, so I've got the ten principles here: of stakeholder engagement. I'm not going to read them all out, but. I think they were all very, you know, they're all very important and shouldn't be forgotten. One of the things that we did as well is like we, we took like a sales approach, like we had like a pitch that we um, that we gave to new people. We developed uh, objection handling, so common things common questions or common issues that we got raised back to us we developed like standard answers to and we could just say them and had and had frequently asked questions document so we had all these resources to help us through that stakeholder engagement and through those conversations and and then we also another thing we did so we did a lot of a lot of comms so we did internal blogs um, and we would go we would give any presentation that we could give um, out on any call but then as well as that we also did um, an external press release which is what you can see on the right here um, and that was really cool because 
So, uh, you know, it takes a lot to get a press release approved in the Ministry of Defence. You know, they're, they're very careful with what they what they want to put out outside. Um, and there's also like a running joke, if you work there, that like about the Daily Mail test. So if you're doing something and you think, oh, should I be doing this? I think it probably applies to the whole of government. You think, well, what would happen if this got into the Daily Mail? Like, if you know, if the Daily, if this got into the Daily Mail and, and the Ministry of Defence looked bad, then you shouldn't be doing it. So there's a running joke about the the, ma- the Daily Mail test, and we actually managed to get um, we actually managed to get a positive news article in the in in the Daily Mail. So that was a huge achievement which everyone was excited about. And not only that, we also got into the Washington Post. So I like to think that Joe Biden was reading about the US-UK collaboration on bug bounties. You know, that's the story I'm going to tell. Whether it's true, we're not quite sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I think just just to really um, say that again, like communication, stakeholder engagement, you can never do it. I think, that, like with with stuff that's that's quite different and quite challenging, and especially in a big, a big complex stakeholder landscape, you can't do it enough. It's really important. Okay, so on to the next slide. So, uh, enable action by removing barriers. So we were um, so. We were able. One of the big, the big barriers that we knocked down was getting the contract in place with the supplier. So um, we managed to, you know, by, because it was it was a new company, it was a new way of working. By getting that con- that first contract in place, that that kind of set a precedence that enabled future contracts like that to be put in place. So that was that was a huge barrier that we overcame. Um, and then once we did that, we realized that like internal teams, when they were deciding which method to use to test their assets, you know, we didn't, they're not going to, they're not, they don't have that much time like on their hands to be or like, and they're probably quite risk averse that they probably don't want to, like if they need to do a security test, they're not going to think, oh, let's do this one that's, that's never been done in the Ministry of Defense before. So what we did was we, there was central funded provided for it and we had a dedicated team to manage and support the asset owners through the challenges. We provided them with resources and how to guides. Um, so we helped break that like this is new barrier down for them. Uh, we also established a cross organizational steering group and worked and worked with other organizational steering groups that were appropriate. And then another thing that we did was we it's like making sure that the governance was appropriate for the stage that the project was at. So in the early stages, we had much lighter governance because, um, it, you know, you want to be careful not to, to bog your team down with with too much process. But obviously you need enough to give give people reassurances. And then as the project matured, then we got um, more and more governance involved. Okay, so if we can go to the next slide, please. So generate short-term wins. We were always doing this. So we started with the pilot and then we built from there. So we established the VDP, we shared the results and shared the success. We then, systems that had been involved in that, we kind of upsold to them and got them involved in our bug bounty. Um, we also, once we've done a bug bounty, we use this, we, we share the success of that and we use that to obtain more funding. Um, so I think being able to show that you are delivering benefits really quickly is always good. But obviously you have to be strategic. Like, you know, we picked the vulnerability disclosure program to go first because it was like, it was um, easiest to do. It was least risk, and and so it's like uh, yeah, choose which ones you're going to go with first. But it was really important to generate those short-term wins. So if we go to the next slide, so build on the change. So after every time we had a win, or every time we'd done something, we've done a challenge, we would always do lessons learned. Um, and like even things that have gone well, why did we how why did that go well or even how can we do it better next time? And then we also when we we communicated these lessons learned 
to the next round of people that were getting involved so that they could see these are the problems that we've had before, this is how we're going to mitigate it, and it kind of gave them that reassurance that we were taking it seriously. And also mitigated the rumour mill because, you know, there was a couple of things that didn't go perfectly, and, um, and, and so, we, um, so we didn't want... Uh, our future people getting involved to hear off previous people like oh this is this has gone wrong and you know so we were getting ahead of that story by communicating what had gone wrong and how we were mitigating it to them first so yeah after the success of the pilot phase we grew the team increased the number and the size of the challenges and then once that we'd done a few of those and that had gone well, we were then even able to increase the scope of the team to, to cover other types of cyber testing. And again, as I said, like between both of these earlier, between both of those things is like revisiting steps one and four and making sure that each time you're adding new scope and you're you're going for a bigger step, make sure that those first steps, one to four, the preparing for change steps, that they're still appropriate and they're still working. Okay, on to number eight. So this is our last step. This is making change stick. So we established new business processes. Um, we measured the success, communicated that integrated with other new business processes across cyber so we had an awareness of what other cyber processes were being changed and and got ourselves on board with those and we shared the feedback um, and then something that you can see on the right is we actually got our CISO Christine Maxwell she we got her to give a talk at, um, at a conference and with one of the um, one of the CTO from Hacker One. So we also were uh, that's yeah that's showing that like she's really committing to the change. Okay, on to the next slide. So outcomes and benefits. So. The project's overall objective was to demonstrably reduce the mod cybersecurity risk and protect critical assets and systems. So our outcomes, so we found vulnerabilities in the strategically important mod systems, which the Ministry of Defense can then resolve. And then we were also able to find some vulnerabilities that had been missed by other to other cyber security tools such as so one of the systems had had a pen test a penetration test and, and we found vulnerabilities that hadn't been found by that so we so that was that was pretty cool and we provided the ministry of defense with access to an additional pool of resources deploying ethical hackers effectively crowdsourced a new security tool and we gave them um, we gave them the vulnerability disclosure, which has already been adopted into the Ministry of, of Defence's BAU capability, and so they're getting these new capabilities. The benefits um, included, um, I mean, this is the the big the big the big one really is like the cultural change that was we were we weren't the only project that delivered that culture change. There was a culture change project too, but I like to think we had quite a big effect. Um, in the circles we were working in around addressing and, man and managing vulnerabilities to make it a more positive, collaborative, forward-thinking culture. So finding a, finding a vulnerability should be celebrated. This is the positive thing. You've got there before a hacker, before it's been exploited. This is awesome. It's not another problem for you to solve. It's actually you, it's a win against you. Against, it was a win for you. Um, we hopefully engaged and energized the cyber community to challenge preconceptions. Um, and we improved, I mean, this one for me, I often forget about, but this was the, the piece de resistance, but um, because it was kind of like the one thing that we really had to achieve, which is, of course, we improved the cyber resilience. Um, okay, so now we're gonna go to the next slide, please. So this is some of the feedback that we received. Um, so I'm just gonna leave this here for a minute for you to read. Okay, so if we go to the next slide, I'll just round off with why I think this was successful, kind of summarize the points that I've made. So first of all, for a particularly innovative project, the application of business change is so important, like 
don't forget to like that this is you are delivering I know all projects are delivering a change but I think using that business change approach is really useful when it's particularly innovative now secondly in a large and complex stakeholder environment prioritize stakeholder engagement make that a huge focus and keep doing it all the time and lastly, don't underestimate the power of something cool or sexy to turn heads. I think the fact that everyone, that hackers sound scary, it, you know, it excites people and that, that helps them change their perspective. Um, great. So on to the last slide, please. So I just wanted to leave you with this thought that, you know, maybe we should all think like a hacker. So never assume an approach or technique is invalid. Play to your strengths, observe expected behavior, and examine outliers. And that's it. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Excellent. Thank you, Sophie. Uh, great presentation. And I'm, I'm just on the Daily Mail online site, and I, <laughs> I promise you, you, you're not featured as yet, so you're, um, you're safe to go into work tomorrow, so you're, you're all right. Um, apologies, I haven't got my camera on. Um, so I've had a couple of questions come in and I've had a, a couple of um, lovely comments as well. So I'll start with those. Uh, someone said, thank you very much for uh, sharing with us. Um, really great to get involved via the polls as well. So I'm going to dive into the question. And um, the first one's from Steve, who said, how did you ensure the hackers declared their findings and not exploit the defense networks? Yeah, so this is, I didn't really go into this, but this is part of how it's all set up. So um, uh, HackerOne is a platform kind of like Uber. So if you think about how Uber connects uh, people who want a taxi with people who drive taxis. So um, HackerOne connects people who want hackers with hackers. And um, on the platform on HackerOne, hackers have a rating, they have a background, and like their and their rating on the background, their rating on the platform is really important to them. A lot of the hackers that the Ministry of Defence choose to work with are the top hackers on the platform. And this is like a really big part of their life. And for some, it's their full time job. They earn that much money off it. Well, some of them earn a lot. Um, but so the, the incentive is there, like if they were to break the rules and to do something to take advantage of the Ministry of Defence, then they'd get blacklisted from the platform, which would mean which would get rid of their way of making money. So, yeah, it's it's that's kind of the incentive. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Sophie. Uh, and Steve also added great job. Um, Ashok has asked and you might have covered that in your previous answer. Do you sus suspect any double agent hackers? You said only by invitation. Um, yeah, no, I, I don't. I don't. We yeah, we only invited um, like a limited number. I'm sure like there is definitely got to be. There is always the risk of an insider threat. I think that that's definitely the case. I'm sure that there there's probably some within all organisations, or that they're generally as the statistics show tends to be at some point. Uh, but the hackers that we invited were not double agents. But yeah. Oh, good, good news. Um, <laughs> so I, I welcome additional questions from from the audience. Uh, if anyone has any, please uh, post them in your control panel. At this point, I'm going to bring back Paul as well. Um, Paul, do you have any additional questions or anything to post to Sophie? Well, no, I just want to say, I mean, I think it's an absolutely fascinating topic. Um, did the MOD kind of discuss any plans of rolling this out a bit wider or kind of doing, you know, a more kind of sustainable program around this? Or? More sustainable, what did you say? More enduring kind of program to, to repeat this approach. Yeah. It's still going. So I've obviously left, but um, I mean, it's still going. It's still growing. I'm still, still going, still growing. Um, yeah. It's it's yeah it's a growing capability. They want to transition this to into business as usual and make it. And some of it's already transitioned, but not all. And yeah, they want to make 
it a permanent feature and can and not only that like the intention is not just to like make bug bounties a permanent feature but it's to keep looking at what are the new methods what are the new approaches and to keep integrating the new techniques and keeping pace with them as they get developed so they're really trying to position themselves as a cyber leader which i think they are yeah. um but that's that's important to them I was just going to ask because I love the, the think like a think like a hacker mm -hmm. kind of strap line that you've got. This is applicable to us in our personal lives as well, isn't it? That when we're yeah. doing passwords or personal cyber security, it's got to be applied as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, I just joined Hacker One, which is a security company, and I was, uh, you know, you know, the like this is so basic, but I think everyone needs to know it. So like, the, you should all all your passwords should be. I was always told three words. But I joined Hacker One, and we've got four word passwords. So yeah, we're going up to four words here. If I'm um, if you're making a password anytime soon. <laughs> I definitely uh, thanks for that, Sophie. Um, I'll quickly change my passwords. Actually, um, I've got a, a further question that's coming. Uh, did you discover any zero day vulnerability? Those commands. Those com that command large bounties 3k I think you mentioned seems rather small for finding a bug. How much was an average of big bounty? Um, I'm wondering what I'm allowed to say. Um, I think I can't really. I mean zero. So zero days. We I I can't I can't mention what vulnerabilities were found. I think like. 3,000, yeah, is, so um, I can give you an idea for like, in general, what how, what gets paid out for bug bounties. Um, what, so uh, like a critical vulnerability is always paid in US dollars, like a mid-ground critical vulnerability would be say 5,000 US dollars. That's the highest level about, yeah, a middling type like if you're gonna if it requires special skills like say it's in crypto for example crypto vulnerabilities people will they get paid they pay out like maybe like um a million i don't know like a lot like a like lots but um average average vulnerability payments are probably between 500 to five thousand dollars but if you think that that could be someone who spent two days work on that um so it's a lot of money for two days work we, we won't say that. I'll, I'll tell everyone to stay in the project management profession, stick with the API, <laughs> charter profession. I, I don't go down this hacking route. It, you know, you, you won't sleep at night. Um, so they don't. I, I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna jump into Stuart's comment, and it's a comment rather than a question. Then I'll move on to the additional question. Stuart says, "Thank you for helping to keep the Ministry of Defence secret, secure, mm -hmm. and therefore making the country a safer place." Um, I'm, I'm sure we all echo that. There we go. Um, Alfie has said, how wide a range of backgrounds were the invited hackers from? People with formal cyber uh, experience through education um, and work experience? Um, I've actually got some there. notes. I got some notes on this. I was, um, I was going to tell you about that, but I think it dropped out. Of, um, just see if I can find it. Yeah, okay, I'll read you some of the stats. So nearly 58, so this, these are like Hacker One stats for the people registered on their platform. So nearly 58% of them are self-taught hackers. 50% of them have, have studied computer science and undergraduate or graduate level. 26.4% 26 studied computer science in high school or before. Less than 5% have learned hacking skills in a classroom. Oh, here's some, some um, finance ones. 12% of hackers on Hacker One make $20,000 or more annually from bug bounties. Over 3% are making more than $100,000 $100, per year. I think it's 100000 for crypto, not a million. I think it might have gone too far there. Um, and 13.7% say that bounties earned represents 90 to 100% of their annual income. Uh, it's quite cool like some of them like some of them have very normal jobs like being a doctor or working um in the like so there'll probably be people in the mod or in the national society cyber security center that are, will also hack in their spare time it's a whole range of people also just nerds in their bedrooms yeah <laughs> excellent thank you um 
Ashok, who asked you the question about the money, um, has said that he's probably in the wrong game if I'm going to make a million pounds. Um, but I think you just eased yeah. his, his uh, career change yeah. there, which is good. Uh, yeah, I mean, I uh, Alfie, I hope that helps with the stats that Sophie kindly uh, provided in an insight into um, the people involved. Uh, Stuart has said, could you expand on the point that you made on how you prevented failures affecting new staff joining and getting affected by them? And he says, thank you. Uh, failures affecting new staff joining. I'm not quite sure what you mean. Sorry. I do mean like uh, I do in general new staff joining. Uh, yeah. Stuart, if I could just ask you to clarify your question. Um, I'll move on uh, to the next question. Uh, we'd be interested, so Alfie again, would be interested to know around the countries of origin and how security clearances, etc., were approached, if that was relevant under the scope. So for the Ministry of Defence, they, they took a decision about what countries they would choose hackers from. Um, obviously, there were no hackers from you know countries you wouldn't expect, like there was no hackers from China, from Russia, that were to participate. Um, yes, yeah, so we had, we had rules in place around that and their country of origin, for sure. Um, but um, the countries that we see, like some of our top hackers from, are like the United States, India, there's like a there's a big the big community in India, um, uh, Singapore, um, Argentina, um, yeah. So there's some there's some different countries out there that have got big hacking communities, um, and it's also quite interesting. Uh, I learned that like so some of the say if people submit a vulnerability, and it's just it's considered informative, then normally people will pay out like fifty dollars, fifty US dollars. And to some hackers, say in India, like fifty US dollars is actually quite a lot of money. It'll change their month, and so like and so like it's worth them submitting something just to get that. Um, yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Stuart hasn't uh, clarified his question, so apologies, Sorry. Stuart, if I've if I've read it out incorrectly. Um, so Steve's popped back to say thanks, so great presentation. Um, thanks. So that's great to see. I, I think at this stage we've gone through all of the great questions and thank you everyone for submitting it. And uh, those that got the, the poll question wrong, next time you ask, mm -hmm. you, can, you can get that right. So that's that's good to know. Uh, so some some definitely some knowledge being taken away. So Paul, if you don't mind, I'll pass over to you to bring to, tonight to a close. But thank you, Sophie. Yeah, th thanks, Rob. Um, likewise, thank you very much, Sophie. Really appreciate you uh, doing this webinar. Like, it's a really interesting and innovative uh, topic. Also, I'd like to say thanks to everybody that's uh, dialed in the webinar. Thank you for your participation and your, your questions. That's been fantastic. Uh, and then finally, just like to say thank you very much to Rob uh, from the APM for hosting the event, making sure it ran really smoothly. So, yeah, thank you, everybody. Uh, take care and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks. Bye-bye.